Basically, the thesis, just to summarize again, is, is the idea that progress and technology and information are progressing very, very rapidly. And, and the functional result of that is we always have more, more and more of everything faster and faster. Um, if you do a curve of this, it is an exponential curve. Uh, that's a very dramatic curve that's first flat and uh, on the baseline and goes straight up like a rocket blast, if you can visualize that. Um, and I believe that this curve and this uh, process of progress giving us more and more, which I call profusion, is an irreversible thing. And most people treat it as a good thing. We want more progress. Yeah. We want more of all of these things. So you have progress giving us more. It's irreversible. It's exponential in the way that it's developing. And that's very dramatic stuff. Uh, but you also have to factor in fallenness. A lot of futurists forget to factor in fallenness. With everything that's invented, with everything that appears on the world stage, there's a fallenness defect associated with it. There's either some potential flaw or actual flaw that kind of is a monkey wrench in the system, something that sort of uh, causes our day not to flow right, you know, problems that erupt all the time. And that fallenness is familiar to Christians and even to non-Christians that things just don't go perfectly. It's sort of Murphy's Law, I guess, yeah. applied to everything. Um, and so once you factor in fallenness and realize that progress is giving us more technology, more information, more weaponry, more communications, more mobility, more people, more money, because money is fueling a lot of this as well at exponential rates, and you factor in fallenness to that, then that fallenness, when you examine it, has the ability now to exact more damage than it used to have. Now, the good still outdistances the bad. I completely agree with that. Maybe a hundred times, maybe a thousand times. We ought to be grateful for that, that the good of progress outdistances and outweighs the bad. But this fallenness and this little sub-parade that fallenness is assembling here is something we have to look at separately and account separately. Because once it's bad enough, it will exact major damage, cataclysmic damage on the world stage. All right, let's talk about what you call the threshold of lethality uh, in your book. Uh, describe some of those um, possibilities yeah. that could uh, lead to disaster. The threshold of lethality, I think, is one of the contributions that I make in this book to future studies that uh, that from anybody who reads this, the light will turn on in their head if they're a futurist. And I say, you know, that is true. We've got to take that seriously. Let's just look at cancer, for example. Cancer starts with like one cell. You have 100 trillion cells in your body. One cell decides it's going to get a little weird, and it, and it, it keeps replicating faster and faster. And pretty soon, you've got a whole bunch of cells that are just in a subclinical state, and then they start developing some symptoms and you have some symptoms related to that. But as this cancer develops, it doesn't have to kill off all the organ systems of the body at the same time. Um, for example, if it's in your liver, all it has to do is choke off the functioning of the liver. Yes. You can have a great brain, you can have a great heart, great lungs, you can have great legs, you can have good kidneys, but you can't live without your liver. And so the, the threshold of lethality is when fallenness reaches a certain line, which I define as the threshold of lethality, then that automatically trumps progress. I don't care how much progress you have. It makes no difference how much progress you have. For example, when the World Trade Towers was bombed years back, if they instead had used a nuclear weapon, and the Pentagon all agrees that the time will come when nuclear weapons will be used, probably even within our borders. But if they had a suitcase with a nuclear weapon, it would have vaporized three square miles of Manhattan Island. Now, what is to stop that from happening down the road? Take it far enough out, take the technology far enough out, give people more and more money. Osama bin Laden right now has control of, they say, a billion dollars. That can buy a lot of damage. And the trend lines are all going in this direction, where fewer and fewer people have control of more and more technology, more and more computer power, more and more money, and mobility— and so they can do nefarious things. But it isn't just rogue uh, people and rogue nations and individual players. There's other uh, scientific uh, trends like nanotechnology or robotics or genomics are three that have been 
uh, talked about quite a bit uh, recently in the news, and uh, we can go into those if you want to. I don't know how interested just, you are. Just very quickly, give me the definition of those. Uh, well, robotics, three. for example. The, the, probably in the year 2020, robots will be smarter than humans for the first time. But they're gaining. Every year, uh, they, they make computing power that's faster and faster and more powerful. And by the year 2020, uh, they will equal the human brain. And so there are serious scientists, I, I feel not Christians, but serious scientists who are talking about post-human species. When the robots get smarter than we are, more powerful than we are, the only way that we will be able to then survive is merging with robotic species. And they're talking about post-human species. This is not any longer science fiction. This is stuff that serious people are looking at. They're looking at a utopian future that will start probably in 2030, 2040, 2050, where we will be doing this, and we will then be able to evolve in amazing ways. Nanotechnology is another thing. Nanotechnology deals with individual atoms. Um, a cell has a trillion atoms in it. A human cell has a trillion atoms in it. And cells manipulate um, molecules and then atoms. Well, nanotechnology, you build a little nanobot, a little, little tiny robot, maybe about the size of a cell, and it figures out how to take the carbon atoms and stack them next to each other, okay? Now, if you can do that with carbon atoms, you can make windows out of diamonds, and it'll cost you five cents. And so people are excited about nanobots that in nanotechnology, even in health applications. But the problem is you've got a nanobot, and you've taught it how to do this. You need more than one nanobot. You need lots of nanobots to put them to work on this. So you make nanobots self-replicating. And this is precisely the problem related to this. Well, what if you don't build in a stop for their replication? By tomorrow noon, will the entire globe will be knee in nanobots? This is not our imagination. This is not fantasy. This is not science fiction. This is real stuff that scientists are thinking about. See, this isn't rogue terrorists that we're talking about, like the weapons of mass destruction perhaps would be. But this is, this is science that people are anxiously trying to make happen because you, if you could successfully come up with nanobots, you could make a trillion dollars for your company using nanobots. And so there's a lot of gas being thrown on this fire. But it's worrisome if you take these implications out far enough and factor in fallenness. So that we've got a lot coming down the road very quickly. What are some of the other threats to us? Uh, I, I've been at the Pentagon several times. I've been in a national security seminar for a week. I, I know what they're thinking. They're worried about weapons of mass destruction in terms of nuclearization. Uh, they are worried about um, of, uh, chemical weapons and about biological weapons like anthrax and so on. And sooner or later, these things are indeed going to happen. It will be very, very difficult for us to, to stop. Uh, there are 10 million people per day that cross international boundaries. And any bug known to humankind can jump inside a human host. That person can get on a plane and fly anywhere in the world during the incubation period of that disease. And so infectious pandemics are a real concern. In 1918, there were 20 million people worldwide that died of influenza. Uh, so we can have something related to anthrax or Ebola or smallpox or even a very virulent strain of influenza. And I don't want to stake my reputation or my sanity on any one of these. I'm just saying that the conditions today are different, and they are kind of ripe for these things exacting turmoil. And I don't live in despair, and I don't sit around and worry about these things. I do think deeply about them, but then I come back to the fact that God is God. God is God, and he knows what's going on, and nothing takes him by surprise, and he's more powerful by infinity than any of these things that are threatening us. And so that's a good place to park your security, and I do that all the time, and it helps me so much. It would appear that we are moving towards some kind of endpoint, uh, and you're looking at it uh, coming from many different roads, but it all seems to lead in the direction that the Scripture has told us that Things are going to change, that there is an age that will end. And the things that you've said today and yesterday imply that we may not be very far away from it. You're not putting a timetable on it. But these things, you know, you were talking about 2030 and 2050. Those are the lifetimes of our kids and our grandkids. Uh, is that the direction you think we're going? Uh, yes, and irreversibly. I do not know how we as a country, as a nation, as a world system can avoid the consequences of the things that I've spelled out. I have thought about this for five or six years now. I've looked at it from every possible angle. I say, where's the loophole? Where's the escape hatch? John Updike says what we need is progress with an escape hatch. <laughs> and he's about right on that. But we, there's no escape hatch that I can see uh, short of the sovereignty of God himself. God himself intervening and saying, I'm not going to let this uh, proceed in the direction it appears to be going. 
Um, and so we need to be seriously looking at the science related to this and be sure to factor in exponentiality. But it also has a tremendous um, implication for the theology of us in our personal lives, trusting God more, being more dependent, getting rid of our fear because God says, get rid of your fear. I am here. I am here and I am able. This is not a game. Uh, I'm real. I know all about your life and uh, you need to put your hand in my hand and trust me, I will get you through this and we'll talk again on the other side. You'll find out that everything is all right. All right, let's bring this way down from the theoretical level to the life of the person who's listening to us. We've got folks out there who are worried about how in the world they're going to meet their next mortgage payment and how they're going to get the kids to school tomorrow morning and uh, these medical tests that are coming back. They're they're very concrete uh, anxieties in people's lives. And yet here we are today talking about these macro issues that could end the world. Uh, How does a person cope with all that? Several things. First of all, I would say that understanding is its own reward. Uh, We can stick our head in the sand about these issues. That isn't going to make them go away. These things have to be confronted. But I do have a message for individuals. I dedicated this book to our two boys. Linda and I together dedicate. Could I just read that? It's two sentences. And this sounds like such a strange thing to do. Our two sons are Adam and Matt. Um, I say your generation will surely witness interesting days. My advice, don't quit. Just live ready. Conduct your studies with diligence, your work with perseverance, your relationships with grace. Seek authenticity at the highest level for one of the great gifts of authenticity is that it leaves us continuously ready for what comes next. Mm -hmm. What I would tell people to do in their personal life is to live ready. Somebody once said we should plan as if God's coming back in 100 years, but we should live as if if Christ is coming back today. And I think that's a very good balance to strike a very good balance. If death came and knocked at our door and said, come with me, a lot of us would say to death, "Uh, give me a month to get ready. Would you just give me a month to get ready? And I would say, Get ready for what? Why do we need a month to get ready? To start living consistent with our beliefs, to start putting our priorities into place. If that's what we need a month to get ready, why don't we just live ready? Why don't we have authenticity at the highest level in all areas of life, in in our values, in our vision, in our lifestyle, in our relationships, so that if Christ came back today, we're ready. One of my definitions of authenticity is that when we die and go to the other side, The difference between our life and our testimony is so small that God Uh doesn't have to change hardly anything. Uh And that is my agenda for the church and for the people of God and for families. Start doing in a serious, radical way what the scriptures have called us to do. Start loving people as if you meant it. Start living for God. Start loving your neighbors. Start spreading the good news, a message of reconciliation. It talks about patience and kindness and lowliness and gentleness and meekness and and all of the fruits of the Spirit. And we can put those into our lives right now and have a tremendous effect on a, a needy world who's chaotic, who's casting about. We have a place to stand that God has given us. It's unmovable and unshakable. He's given ministries to us that are simply unprecedented. And he said, I'll hold your hand. I am here. This is not a game. I'm real. I'm right behind you. Believe me. And the scriptures is through through and through talks about that sovereignty and power and intimacy of God. And so start time to live as if we actually believed it and then do the ministry that God has placed before us and leave the timing to God. And he's told us not to hold too tightly to the things of this world. It's going to be torn loose from our hands one way or the other. You know, whether or not the the world spins out of control uh, in our lifetime or whether we simply go on to be with the Lord, the result is the same. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. There used to be an old Stamps Quartet song uh, that that made that case. In fact, many of the, the the hymns of the church in the past talked about the future, talked about uh, heaven. Uh, yes. uh, when we all yeah. get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing this will be. Now we talk more about uh, kind of linking into the power of God for more successful living yeah. here, uh, prosperity and, and promise and health and so on. But the scriptures all point toward the future. 
And we really need to hold lightly the things that seem so concrete today because they really aren't. I think in many ways this is a test pattern. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, I think I'm doing all these projects for God, and then yeah. maybe I'm the project. Maybe <laughs> God is working on me. Maybe the Holy Spirit is just testing me to say, Dick, I want to conform you to the image of Christ. And, you know, I'm worried about does a dog have enough food? Is there macaroni? Is the potato all well done? Has the oil been changed? And those are all important things in a certain context. But there's a larger agenda and there's a critical nature to this agenda. There are people to be loved. There's a message to share to the world. Uh, God has given us these kinds of ministries, and he says, maybe the time is short. I'm not going to let you know exactly, but maybe the times are short. There's the fig tree there. Maybe the yeah. time is short. Why don't you get about my business? We know that the Holy Spirit of God is building the kingdom of God today, right as we're sitting here on our generational shift very rapidly. Intentional Christianity is growing at a rate three and a half times that of global population growth. There are places Places in the world where people are flocking into the kingdom of God. So God's already at work, and uh, we just need to join him in that work and cooperate with the work that God is doing, set aside some of the stresses and overload and trivialities of our day-to-day, and uh, just start, start doing what Christ has beckoned us to do all along. Now, let me get you to say it again. You talk about a lot of catastrophic circumstances in this book, but you're not fearful for the future. For one reason— because God is God. I do not have to deny any kind of trauma that is in front of me. A refiner's fire is sometimes biblical, but God will always redeem it. You have to put your hand in God. And don't con God about whose side you're on. I mean, we sort of want to be good Christians, but we want to have a foot in this world too, you know, but those two worlds are diverging and we're going to get a serious growing pull if we don't make up our mind about citizenship. So this this agenda that I'm talking about, uh, this scenario that I'm painting, which I think is true, I would be very surprised if 100 years from now this has not unfolded exactly the way that I'm explaining it now. Uh, but I do not regard that as a threat. It's a wake-up call to the church to be authentic at the highest level. As you uh, think ahead to the coming days and months, what kind of thoughts do you have? Uh, you don't know whether or not some of this may occur in the next year or two. Uh, when you contemplate these things, uh, how do you pray and what is your attitude toward the immediate future? Several things. One, I, I just am grateful to God for the privilege of living today. Uh, that might sound uh, strange given the topic that we've covered. God's not a random God. It's not a cosmic accident that you and I are sitting here and alive today. I mean, he picked me, he picked you, he picked everybody who's listening to, this, to be alive today. He's given us a ministry, a specific ministry to do, and he, will, he has faith in our ability to do that ministry. And I say, thank you, God, for p- putting me on a stage at this very, very interesting time, giving me this ministry of hopefully speaking encouragement and hope to individual people and 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 explaining to them the bigger picture, the picture that includes God and things that are possible and yeah. positive and the common good and bigger myself that I can give myself to. S.J. Perlman once said, I don't know where we're going or how we'll get there, but when we get there, we'll be there, and that's something even as nothing. <laughs> well, this should be the model of the church. Yeah. We know where we're going and why we're going, and God's left a record for us. So I'm grateful to God. And number two, I would say, God, make me faithful. If if the world system turns up the pressure in my life, am I going to bail? I don't want to. I don't know completely the answer to that question, but boy, I want to be faithful all the way to the end. And the third thing that I would say is, God, make my life say love. Yeah. I, I I hesitate to even use that word because it's been so cheapened in our society. But I believe that's the word. That is the word of eternity, and everything has to go through that door. So whether it's my writing, whether it's my relationships, whether it's my interactions with strangers or whatever I do, uh, it has to say love because God himself is love because without love we are nothing. It's the greatest commandment. All the commandments wrapped up in this to love. And so if, if if people had to focus on one thing that they should do, They should love. And you know, love wins even when it dies. If evil comes through the door and kills love, God adjudicates. God stands on the sidelines. He looks down and he says, you win. Love laying on the floor. And uh, he has that kind of power. We just have to do it right. The things are, he's explained it for over 2,000 years. um, And we need to be serious about radical authenticity. What this discussion today and last time uh, emphasizes for me is the return of Christ. I can't wait for him to come. There was a time when I was younger that I had a lot of things I wanted to do, and I was uh, enjoying what I'm doing. I still am. 
But the older I get, the more excited I am about that moment when Amen. he returns. I mean, if there were a red button here and I could hit it and bring him <laughs> back, I would jump for it. And uh, I believe he's coming. And I believe his return is imminent. I, I'm not going to select a date again because people have gotten in trouble with that. But we can see the fig tree. We are the generation of the fig tree, I believe. And we can see that that the time is ripe. And uh, I can't wait for it. It's his biblical return. to look forward to it. Sure We're it supposed is. to be looking That's for right. this. And the whole greeting of Maranatha talks about that, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Um, I, I live under the weight of fallenness. I feel that every single day when I get out of bed, I feel the weight of fallenness. This doesn't mean that I'm a joy, joyless person at all. I, I, I enjoy life, and I enjoy relationships. I enjoy laughing, and I enjoy lots of things. But I feel the weight of fallenness. It'll be so wonderful when God comes and sets things right. Can you imagine what it would be like <laughs> to get out of bed and not have fallenness in the world to deal with anymore? I mean, who wouldn't be? looking forward to a condition that's going to look like that. Perfect bodies. As a physician, you can appreciate that. And then I've I've done a a book recently on sovereignty of God, and he's going to rewrite the rules of physics, and he's going to allow so, I mean, different dimensions maybe of space and time. I mean, what does God have prepared for us? It says things beyond our seeing, things beyond our hearing, things beyond our very imagining for what God has in store for those who love him. So this is just a vapor. This is just a vapor. It's just a breath. Uh, scripture says. And so we just have to hang on, do it right for vapor's length of time. Then we're home for eternity. We can celebrate and there'll be so much to celebrate. It's amazing that a discussion about hurtling toward oblivion could be so positive. And yet the scriptures call it a mystery that we should be of good cheer in the midst of tribulation. That's the message of scripture. And that's what you're trying John to say 16, here. John 16, 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken unto you, so that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, yeah. but be of good cheer. So he said it right there. In yeah. the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That message is as real. To, just because he said it 2,000 years ago doesn't mean he didn't say it to me and to you. And we need to take our security from that. The book is published by Nav Press, Hurtling Toward Oblivion. A Logical Argument for the End of the Age. Dr. Richard Swenson, thank you for being our guest again. Thank you so much.